Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Good to see. I recognize some names, uh, familiar names here. So very excited to be here. Um, the presentation today is going to be done by Michael. Michael is a, a, a deep expert on NLP and uh, and AI. He's been doing AI before since before it was cool. And uh, at the company, we've learned a lot from Michael um, about this particular space when it comes to AI search and NLP. So we decided to take some time and present, uh, share some of his wisdom and uh, dive into the anatomy of a Langchain chatbot and sing a little bit about the unsung hero of, uh, of chatbots, which is search. So with that, I'll pass it on to Michael. Thank you, Kwaja. That's right. So we're gonna show the anatomy of a chatbot. And this is really exciting to me, like you said, because of uh, my background. So I'm Michael Landis. I'm a software engineer here at Memento. I have a deep background in AI, NLP, search, and software. So a topic like vector search and chatbots is near and dear to me. And I'm really excited about this because we've seen a lot of presentations on chatbots and demos, and you see a lot of uh, superficial details just scratching the surface on a lot of different places. So I'm gonna really laser in on one of those in particular, which is search. So I'm gonna cut right to the chase. At Memento, we've built Robomo. So our mascot at Memento, uh, as you all know, is this uh, charming little squirrel. And uh, we're not putting him out of a job, we're just uh, helping him out. And so we've made a chatbot uh, that can be uh, the voice uh, of Mo, that can answer questions about Memento's services, documentation, and uh, even contents from our blogs. So it's technical, super smart, and really relevant to uh, things we care about at Memento. And so how do we build this? So we started the talk saying with the title that this is shockingly simple. And so when we say shockingly simple, we mean it. This is the whole code for the chatbot, all in one screen. And I'm gonna get to this uh, later in the talk, but I just wanted to show it up front. So we're leveraging a few services here to get this going. We have uh, number one, OpenAI's text embedding model. Uh, number two, Memento Vector Index, which actually uh, stores the, uh, the Memento documentation and blogs. And then we have uh, number three, a chatbot model, which is being powered by one of OpenAI's uh, chat models. So the first question for the talk is, how does the chatbot know about the Memento docs and blogs to answer questions? And the way it knows that is because we've indexed all that data in a vector vector index, a, a search engine, and we're directing the chatbot to forward user questions to that search index for possible answers to users' questions. So a user asks a question, and then we use that question as input to our search. So fingers crossed that our the way we're doing the search captures the relevance between a question and uh, sources that can contain the answers to the question. So Memento Vector Index is the core component for the search here, and it's extremely easy to get going with it. You just need an API key. And in this chatbot, you could even use Memento Cache to store your chat history. So about that search, we're not searching over keywords. We're all familiar with search, and we tend to think of search as what has good overlap with the words and our query. This is a different kind of search, vector search, and to get started, we first need to take the text for the search, our search query, and then turn it into a vector to do vector search. But what is that exactly? So one of the most common questions I get is, what is a vector? What do you mean by that? And you said vector embedding, text embedding. I don't get it. I've never heard of this before. I'm familiar with Elasticsearch, Lucene, keyword search. Is this kind of like that or is it similar? Is it different? And uh, how do I, why do I actually need something new to help out with this search? And I find that in a lot of talks, uh, you'll see something like this. Here's a uh, text embeddings. You get text goes in and a big long list of numbers comes out. Any questions? So I could end the talk here. That's the uh, ending of uh, text embeddings, but no, we're really gonna dig in here and motivate this from first principles. So like I said, we're gonna answer a few key questions. Um, first, how does the chatbot know about Memento docs and examples? I've already answered this, it uses search. And then you'll see how we're gonna really dive into this 
uh, going forward. We're going to zoom into this, this detail, go into some theory, and then zoom back out for more discussion on how to build the chatbot with NVI. So a little bit on the history. This, these text embedding models and vector search didn't just come out of thin air. There's been a long history here. And a lot of it started in the 70s with the seminal work of Gerald Salton. He introduced early keyword or lexical retrieval models for search. And really importantly, the vector space model. We're going we're gonna to really go into that in some more detail at some of the key insights that underlies all of this. In the 80s, there were some commercialization efforts for these search systems. But really importantly, towards the late 80s, we saw the beginnings of the web. And in the 90s, the web became mainstream, a household presence. And as the web grew and grew and grew, it became harder and harder to find things that you want to uh, go look at. And so search and search engines became really competitive. And some of the uh, search experiences you have in the 90s were really bad, like Boolean queries where you'd have to say, I'm interested in this term and that term, but not this one. It took a lot of work. And you had to train yourself on how to actually do a search. In the 2000s, this technology reached maturity, and any developer could pick up some of the search technology off the shelf, and with some added expertise, they could uh, make a search experience. But in the 2010s, we saw the real success of a totally different method of doing this based on neural networks. And that is where the text embeddings and vector search comes in. So we're going to start with a familiar setup, something that I think uh, we could all intuitively grasp as a way you could do search. And uh, we're going to call this the Boolean retrieval model. You'll see why. So we have uh, our first key idea, which is if, if we have a question and we think the answer is in a collection of documents we have, we hypothesize that documents that mention similar words to my question are going to be more relevant. Seems simple enough. And so we can code this up in uh, about an hour or so. So here's what you got to do. If you have a, a question, a query, you just go word by word in the query. And you find any document that contains the word, and you collect uh, all these documents for each of the words. And so now you have a set of documents that are relevant to your query. And now you can go rank them by which ones have the most word overlap to your query. Now, as you see, the core operation here is finding documents that contain a particular word. And we can really speed this up with a data structure called an inverted index. On the right-hand side of the screen, you can see how you would build a inverted index from a set of documents. You would for each document, you would split it up into words, and you record which document it appears in. And then you make a map, so a hash map or a map or a dictionary, depending on what programming language you're using, that maps from a word, a string of text, to a list of the document identifiers that contain the word. So you can see how if you have this data structure, then it's really easy to find documents that contain the word. You build it once up front, and then you can go use it online when you're fielding answers to users' queries. So at small scale, you could use a hash table for this data structure. At scale, though, uh, you're going to use something like a sorted string table, which is, much, which is more friendly to disk access. So that's how we build the index, and that's how we can answer user queries. And so we're getting started here. This is great. There's one other thing we need, which is storage for the metadata. So you also want to store things like the original document, not just um, you don't want just the index, and maybe things about the document, like who wrote it, the URL it came from, and so on. And so you can see how this can get you going, but there's some shortcomings here. And we're going to go. Uh, start to patch those up. For one thing, whether if a document contains any word from your query, yes, it's relevant, but suppose I search for something like, um, tell me about Memento services. Then if a document mentions the word Memento and services way more than another document, say they talk about services 10 times versus one time for another one, maybe that document is even more relevant. So we're going to also take into account the not just whether a word appeared or not, 
but how often it appeared. And with this, we're going to take a new view on our data. So like I said previously, documents that overlap more with our query were presumed to be more relevant. And now we're going to take it a step further and say documents that talk more about our query than others are going to be more relevant. That is, if the words appear more. So by taking into account how often a word occurs in a document, then we can view the document as a list of the word counts. That is, for each document, how often does a particular word appear? So really, to make this uh, simple and how you can uh, uh, picture it on uh, one page like we have here, think of a world where the only two words we care about are memento and service. Then for any document, we can represent it as the counts for these two words. Each word is assigned a particular entry in, in a pair, like memento, the count for the words memento would be the first one, service the second. And with that, we can view a document as a coordinate on a grid. So we can plot it like on an XY plane, like you see here. So alternatively, we can view this not just as a point, but as a vector. And that allows us to use even more tools to express similarity. So in the diagram, you can see a, a vector is like an arrow that starts at the origin. And a vector has a length associated with it and an angle of displacement. That is, how far is it lifted off of this axis? So you can think of like a map uh, you know, of, your, of your state or of your city. And on a map, you can identify a location by its latitude and longitude. That's like an XY coordinate or you can identify it by a bearing and a distance from reference point. So if you know your location and you have a compass, you can say some other location is uh, northwest and 100 miles away. So that's like uh, what a vector allows you to do. So you can see how documents with similar proportions of word counts will have similar angles in the vectors. And that's like a new way we can think about similarity. That is, uh, documents that talk about mention similar words probably have similar topics. And so here we're picturing uh, two words, how you can uh, plot that in 2D, but whether you have three words you know about, a thousand or a million, uh, the vector math works out to be the same. So the vector space model, the pivotal idea is we can have a document, text, and we can view the document as a point in space and then if a representation is good, then documents that are similar in their topics or their meaning will be grouped together in these points in space. So now we're taking into account word counts. And so how do we actually then go answer a user's question? So with the vector space model and lexical search, the ranking now boils down to calculating the angle between the query vector and the document vector. We make a query vector by tallying up the number of times a word appears in the query, and document vectors, same thing, how many times words appear in the document. And then we use the mathematical formula for the angle between two vectors. So this is better than a Boolean search. We can still use our inverted index to quickly look up how many times a word appears in a document, but there's uh, some problems. So this is very fast. It can be web scale. You can really interpret when you see like a document vector and you can go far with this, but there's some problems. First, at, at the core, we're relying on word overlap. If this word is in our query, like memento or service, then it has to be in the document for there to be any overlap whatsoever. So what happens if the query uses um, uh, two words that, what if the query mentions a word that means the same thing as another word in a document, but it's just a different word. So like dog and canine are different words, but they have similar meaning. Well, then you don't have word overlap. That's a problem. You could also have two words that are spelled the same, but they mean something different. So like the word bank could mean something in finance, like where you store your money, or it could be mean something like a river bank, the side of a river. And so that's also bad. Lastly, there's no contextual understanding we're capturing here. We're just considering words in isolation. So if I have a sentence like, I'm interested in caching but not topics, then if you're just taking word counts, that has the same word count as I'm interested in topics but not caching. 
So we need contextual understanding too. So just moving on, this, this idea we started with the vector space model. The key idea is that if you have a document, then you can represent it as a point in space. And then similar documents, things that are more relevant to a question, should be at a similar location in space, similar coordinates, similar vector angle. This is a key abstraction. It's like a new interface for our data. And if you can have, if you have any kind of data, we talked about uh, documents, but here we're talking about images. If I can think of an image as a vector, then I can apply the same toolkit to understanding search and similarity. So what is an image? An image is a 2D grid of color points, and a color point can be represented as a number. So an image, you have a 2D grid. You can imagine just unrolling the rows and placing them side by side into a big long list. Now you have a vector. So here I'm showing you how you can interpolate between two vectors, that is blend them together, where we have two images, a cat and a dog, and we can blend the vector representations of these images together and then go visualize what the image would look like. So here you see a cat, and we start with 100% of the cat vector times 0% of the dog vector, and we're going all the way to 100% of the dog vector. And you can see as we blend it, it turns more and more into the dog vector. Now, as you can see here, it's kind of like you see the shadow of the dog here. It's not a good, a good, a great blend. Uh, what you really want to see is like a half cat, half dog. And so the problem here is that our representation for our vectors isn't good enough. With text, we had word counts. And as you can see, that doesn't capture contextual meaning. And for images, we just have the raw pixel values. And that doesn't really tell you about the contents of the image either. So let's go start solving that problem. So you can see how the if we're using the vector space model, we really need good vectors. It's a powerful tool, but how do we get there? So now we're moving away in our timeline from the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s to the 2010s. OK, so we started the talk with our chatbot, and we said we needed a text embedding service to convert between a user question or a document to a vector that we, so that we can then search vector to vector. So just some terminology. When we say text embeddings, we mean the vector view of the text. That is, we're converting the text to a point in space. That's the vector. And we use a particular model to do that. So how do we get those? Well, today, neural networks are the state of the art um, method to do that. We're not going to go into the internals there, but we'll describe the process. I think you'll be surprised to learn that there's actually embedding models in your everyday life. And we're going to start with that on the next slide. So this is what I call the grocery store analogy. I first heard about this from uh, Jeff Hinton, and I'm just going to riff on this here. So when you go to a grocery store, there's all sorts of things in there. Uh, could be foodstuffs, even uh, birthday cards, uh, vegetables. And when you look at something like a bag of flour, for example, it has a list of ingredients, a brand, country of origin. And so we have a grocery store. How do we search for an item in the store? You could just take the text on the item and then make our lexical search using word counts. You could do that. But actually, if you think about how a grocery store works, it's there's something a little more clever going on here. And a grocery store, we could just use location of the item as its vector representation. So if you look up uh, flour, maybe it's on aisle 10, shelf one. Sugar is also on aisle 10, shelf one. And so is baking powder. And these things are related. And you know something different like cereal is going to be somewhere else in the store. So you can see how a, a vector view of flower may be 10 comma 1. Those are the coordinates of flower in the store. And you also see that related items in the store are close together in space. And that's not an accident. So if you knew the location of an item in the store and you just looked around at nearby things, you'd expect to see related items. So if you're in the fruit section, you're looking at an orange. If you look around, you see apples and pears and so on. And that's exactly what we want for our search engine. If we search for a question, we want related documents to be close by in the vector space. 
So when you ask a grocery store worker where something is, they actually run an embedding model in their head to answer your question. So you could say, uh, you could ask the grocery store worker, do you have fresh mozzarella cheese? And they may answer, I'm not sure, but if we did, it would be in aisle three on, on shelf, uh, shelf five. And so what they're saying is they're converting your item that you're interested in into a location and space. And if you've ever been to a store like Home Depot, you know this is even more of a problem. So for the back of your head, think, uh, start, start thinking about how does a computer then search just using coordinates? And so this begs the question, okay, we wanna do this for text. And so how did they actually determine the placement of items in the store uh, uh, for grocery items? So this is what I call the grocery store placement game. Here's how we're gonna do this. We're gonna take our grocery store and place the items completely at random in there. It's gonna be the worst grocery store experience, but just hold on, we're gonna improve it. And now we're going to go in our neighborhood uh, neighbor by neighbor, and just go ask them what they had for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and write down the ingredients in each meal. And then we're going to go back to our store and do the following. For each meal in the notes, we're going to look at the ingredients in the meal, and when, and we're going to bring two ingredients that are in the same meal closer together in the store. And then we're going to go look at uh, two meals, two completely different meals, and two ingredients from two separate meals, and move those farther apart. And we're just going to keep doing this over and over for all the data we collected from our neighbors. And so you can imagine as you do this, then things that are things that are related, that is, belong in the same meal, will be closer together in the store. And at the end of the day, you'll find things like baked goods, for example, flour, sugar, and baking powder will be close together because if you make if a, if a meal has uh, bread or cookies, then those items will tend to co-occur. But something like oranges and tomato sauce will not because they don't tend to be in the same meal. So if you have a machine learning background, you recognize this. This is a contrastive loss function. And by bringing things close together further apart, we're optimizing this loss function over our data set. Also, if you think about this, our data set actually encodes a little bit of bias. So depending on what types of neighbors I have, our grocery store will look different. So in some cultures, for example, people enjoy cinnamon and dessert dishes, but in other cultures, cinnamon is a part of main dishes like rice or lentils and so on. And so depending on your neighborhood, you'll collect different notes and then you'll bring things closer or farther together in the grocery store. That's pretty cool. So, okay, let's take this back to text embeddings. How do we turn text into vectors? So we can bootstrap text embedding models with any text we find in the in the mod, in the wild, and then we can play this game to learn an embedding model. So whereas uh, our grocery store worker uh, helped us uh, be the embedding model, we're going to use a neural network for that instead. And the starting point, instead of being a random placement in the store for the grocery items, it's going to be random random uh, model parameters. And the goal for the text game is. You take uh, a document, an article, a paragraph, and so on, and two pieces of text that are close together. We're going to bring the vector representation of those closer together, farther apart, if they're from unrelated items. So this is great. The flexibility of neural networks are really key here to model the underlying data distribution. They're just really much better than the previous approaches that we saw for the lexical retrieval techniques, where we just took the raw word counts and then used that as our vector representation. So unlike the lexical models, the vector components, remember at the very beginning, I showed this big long list of numbers. Uh, so those numbers do not correspond directly to word counts. It's actually something different. The vector has a more holistic contextual understanding where the direction of the vector is signaling all the different flavors and meanings of the text that you uh, fed in as input. OK, so this sounds good. So let's go use this for our, our search instead of uh, the word counts, because the word counts are brittle. Uh, so let's do that. But actually, you're going to see we're introducing some problems and some pain that we're going to need to solve. So if you remember at the beginning, 
for the Boolean query model, we just said for each word in the query, we're going to go look up what documents had the word. So this is uh, the key part to making search fast for these lexical models. But for this new kind of model, well, each, each part of the vector doesn't correspond to a word, so we can't do that quick lookup anymore. Instead, we have to compare the vector embedding for the query to the vector embedding for every document one by one. And this is really computationally expensive. So uh, for the lexical inverted index model, the cost of doing a search is on the order of the length of the query in terms of words times the cost of doing an inverted index lookup. But for the text embedding model, if you have these dense vectors, they're not sparse anymore. And that involves uh, compute on the order of the number of documents you have times the number of times the length of the vectors. So to get around this, we're going to use some new algorithms and some new systems to get this uh, low latency at scale, because otherwise this is too slow to use. And with this, with these new algorithms, with these new approaches, we're going to have to make some deep trade-offs to make this fast. Trade-offs are going to be between memory usage, the speed of running a query, accuracy results, speed of building the index. And so this takes a lot more expertise. And then managing these systems, configuring them, deploying them becomes a real pain. And we haven't even started talking about doing filter queries on top of this. And so at Memento, we have a solution to this. There's a Memento vector index. It abstracts away all these details and automates key parts for you. So you can just focus on your core application. And you get to use just a very simple API. And then all this complicated machinery is working for you under the hood. OK, so that's the uh, vector space model and how text embeddings work. So now we're going to talk about Memento Vector Index in the context of this chatbot. Here's the architecture of our chatbot. Remember, our chatbot is going to delegate answering questions, that is, finding sources of answers to users' questions to this search process. So what does that mean? It means that the user's questions will literally become queries to our search engine. And we're going to use the state of the art to do that. We're going to use text embeddings to turn the query into a vector that captures the meaning of the question. And then we're going to compare that vector to uh, uh, documents in our vector index to find potential sources of answers. So how do we actually get this up and running? First, we need to get our data. Then we need to convert it to vectors. Then we need to index it in a vector index. To do this, we're going to use three technologies. OpenAI for text embeddings, Memento Vector Index to actually create the search index, and then Langchain to glue this all together in record time. So MVI is a key component for search, and Langchain is for orchestration. But uh, you know what is Langchain? So Langchain is a year old. It's an ecosystem of building blocks to make applications using large language models, or LLMs. Of course, uh, by this point, everyone's heard of LLMs like ChatGPT and so on. They're great. And Langchain makes it really easy for you to build an application leveraging this new technology. It provides key abstractions and integrations into many different technologies so you can really accelerate your development. So for this part in particular, that is, indexing the documents in our search index, we're going to use three key components from Langchain. We're going to use the document loaders to scrape the Memento documents and blogs. We're going to use text splitters. I'll get to that in just a second. And we're going to use uh, vector stores. That way, we can plug in Memento vector index. OK, so let's talk about getting the Memento docs and blogs into our search index. So if you haven't been on the Memento website, I really encourage you to go. It has a really beautiful design and all sorts of great content. This is the blog page. As you can see, there's all sorts of content about databases, caching, topics, uh, really great insights on the technologies and services that Memento provides. I think you'll find all sorts of nuggets and pieces of wisdom here. That will interest you. And we also have the Memento doc technical documentation page, 
which has API references and in-depth guides and how to use the services. So we want to get all this content and bring it into a Memento Vector Index. So I'm now showing a notebook in the RoboMo repo. So RoboMo, the re repository for the source code showing how to make this yourself, it's public. I have a link to it uh, at the end in case you're curious. So this is a Jupyter notebook that details how to actually uh, get the data, pre-process it, and then store it in the vector index. So we're going to rely on web scraping to do this. So I showed the data, the blogs, and the docs are on these web pages. And I set up a little helper here to remove any kind of irrelevant content from the web pages, like the title, header, and so on. We just want the meat. This isn't the important part, but it's just here in case you want to check it out. So there's two document loaders that we're relying on from Langchain. The first is called a sitemap loader. This is great because if your website has a sitemap that is an XML document with a list of all the URLs contained under that site, then this one class from Langchain can just go slurp all that up for you in one go and give you back a list of objects, one for each of the websites with the content inside. So that's great. So this is what we're using to get the technical documents. But for the blogs page, we don't have a sitemap, at least one that I know about. And so what we need to do is to go on that blogs page that I just showed you, this one here, and we need to go collect the links to each of these articles. So that's no sweat. If you've used uh, Beautiful Soup or a web scraping library and your language of choice, this should look familiar. We're just requesting the contents of the uh, blogs index page, and then we're finding all the links that go that have more specific blog entries. This will give us the URLs of the blogs. So once we go read the blog URLs, we have a list of the blog entries here. With the list of the blog entries, we can make use of another Langchain document loader called the web base loader, which takes as input a list of URLs. And then we'll go scrape the text content from those URLs. Really saves you a lot of time here. So here we collected uh, the, we built an object to scrape from the sitemap loader. Here we built an object to scrape from the blog URLs. In this section, we're actually going to gather the content. That's as easy as just calling the load method on these uh, document loader objects. We do that for the tech docs and the blogs. Once we do that, we get back a list of document objects. So again, Langchain has an abstraction for a piece of text called a document, and it has uh, the content as well as any other metadata. So for web pages, our metadata would be things like the URL, the source, and a change frequency that you can uh, get from the web page. Here's an example of some of the text that comes out when you do this. You can see here's a blog that was written by Eric Peterson. It's great. I recommend you check it out. He's the uh, CTO of Cloud Zero. So after this, we're going to gather together all the documents that we collected, the tech docs and the blogs, and join that together in one big list of documents called docs. Now we're going to go prepare this for question answering. Now, here's a subtle point. I mentioned that to do search, we're going to take our text and then compute a vector representation of the text using a text embedding model. Now, importantly, the text embedding is a vector that is a point in space, and this is something that's fixed size. So when I'm using OpenAI, there's 1,500 numbers in that vector, roughly. And you get back 1,500 numbers, regardless of whether you pass in a single word, a sentence, a paragraph, pages and pages of text. You get back the same 1,500 number uh, vector. And so you can see there's a bit of a problem here. You have something that's variable length, text, that you're stuffing into something that's fixed length, a vector. And depending on how much text that you embed at once, you'll get more or less resolution into uh, particular parts of the content of your text. So you need to be careful about how much text you feed in to embed at once. Since we're doing question answering, we want the 
amount of text and a particular embedding to be roughly about a snippet that would contain the answer to someone's question. So I'm choosing 128 words per chunk. So, I'm gonna, so we collected the documents from the blogs and um, technical documentation. And now we're gonna chop those up into even smaller pieces, 128 word uh, uh, sections. And we're gonna also add some overlap between them so that these aren't just um, tiled where there's no overlap between the sections. So once we do this, we go from uh, just over 200 documents to around 3,500 text snippets. So now we have all the documents ready to go and we want to index them into our vector index, memento vector index. So like I said, memento vector index makes this really easy. This is the code you would use in a demo and it's also the code you'd use in production to get this going. So what we're gonna do, I'll get to this, this part in just a second. What we're gonna do is use this helper from Langchain called a vector store. So remember there's all these different components to the Langchain ecosystem. Uh, document loader, which I showed you just before how to get the web page content. Text splitters, that's how we chop up the documents into smaller pieces. And then we have these vector stores. And so those are a common interface in Langchain to interact with a vector index. So Memento has provided an integration into uh, Langchain so that you can just plug Memento Vector Index right in and use these Langchain helpers to load all your documents in just a one-liner. So this is the code you need to take your documents that you collected, convert them into text embeddings, and then store them in a vector store. That's it. So you can see the different parameters here. We have the documents that we collected. Then crucially, we need a text embedding model to convert the text, whether it be the documents that you're storing or a user quest query that comes in, to convert that from text to a vector. We're using this OpenAI embeddings model, ADA2, to do that. That's this. We also need to pass in a client instance of the, vector, the Memento vector index. I set this up right here in just a few lines. You also need to direct it to store these documents in a particular index in your Memento account. So here we're calling this one Memento. And then optionally, for the documents that you're storing, you could provide IDs um, if you want. And so that's what I did up here. For the IDs, I'm just using the original URL of the text plus the, the chunk that it came came from. So you remember I said we originally had these uh, documents. They were either a blog or something from the technical documentation. Then we split it up into smaller pieces. And so what's a good ID for these smaller pieces? And so I'm just saying a good ID would be the URL it came from and then the position of the chunk in the uh, original web page. So just something simple here just to make it a little easier to debug. So you have one line of code here to go embed and index your documents. And then once you do this, you have a search index that's online. So I went over this code in about um, five to 10 minutes and you have a functioning search engine after you do this. And to me, this is astounding. With my background in NLP and search, uh, the amount of work it would take to get something running that you could use in production like this would take a lot of effort. So I'm really proud of how turnkey this is. So once, once we have the data indexed, we can actually query it directly from Langchain with this vector store object that you get. You can call a method called similarity search with score to pass in a string of text as a query and see um, what documents, what chunks are relevant to the question that you asked. So what this is doing under the hood is it's taking this string of text it's passing it through this text embedding model to get a vector. And then it's calling memento vector index to say in the memento index, what are similar document vectors to this vector that we have for this query? So when you do that, you get back a list of documents. So this line chain integration takes the memento vector index results and then transform them, transforms them back into line chain documents. So again, we're in the Langchain ecosystem. 
And you can see that we also stored the original document context in MVI, and that came back as well. So when we ask how much does Memento cost, we see these snippets of text that are all talking about Memento pricing and costing. And then alongside, you see a similarity score here for each of the hits. And this is related to the angle between the vectors, the query vector and the document vector. And so this is great. You can see this, this search, this method of search using text embeddings really works. And so we get relevance. This is great. So that's how the uh, search portion, portion works. But if you remember, we weren't just doing search in isolation. This was part of the chatbot. So we're going to go back to the full chatbot. So MVI is really good with the text embedding model. You get back a full page of results, but that's not really a nice, easy to read answer. It's like if you go on google.com and you type in a question and you get back a million web pages. What you want is just the TLDR. So that's where the chat model is going to come into play here. And really, the heart of this chat model is what's called a language model, or a large language model, as you've heard of nowadays. So a language model is a method to generate text. What it does is you give it some text, and it tries to complete the text, the ending, starting with the text that you gave it. So it predicts what's the next most likely word, and then takes the original text plus this new predicted word and just continues doing this. That's what a language model does. And the language models we have lately are just the most successful way we know about to generate text. So we're going to use this language model to take the user's question, the answers that we got from MVI, that is the search page of results, and the document sources that it came from. And we're going to ask the language model to then take this original user question, these potential sources of answers, and form a fully baked answer for the user, and then to go complete that text. That's where the language model comes in. And so what about Langchain? So Langchain really comes to the rescue here. They have all sorts of high-level abstractions so that you can create a chatbot or agent very easily. Langchain, by doing this, they have become a warehouse for all the proven methods for interacting with language models and getting them to do what you want. So instead of you scouring the land, reading all sorts of different sources for how you should accomplish something, you can go on Langchain and see all the best practices in one place. It really saves you a lot of time. So again, what about that code that I showed at the beginning? We're back here again. And now I hope that some of the uh, fog around how this works has been cleared up. So there's three moving parts to our chatbot. The first two are related to performing a search. So the first one is the text embedding model. That's how we convert from text to vectors. The next thing is the vector store. And so Memento Vector Index handles storing the document vectors and performing the vector to vector search, as well as uh, storing the metadata. And then the last part is the actual chat model. That's number three. And we're leveraging OpenAI's chat models uh, for this, GPT 3.5. And we're using other abstractions from LangChain, in particular, this conversational retrieval chain. What that is, is it's just a series of prompts for the language model, where we direct the language model to form an answer for the user based on their original question, plus the search results from Memento Vector Index. So you can see around number three, says retrieval equals store dot as retriever, the store being memento vector index. So that's the part where this chatbot will delegate um, searching for candidate answers to this vector store, that is to memento vector index. That's what this means. And then this other part here, load QA with sources chain, is just another prompt that tags alongside this that will then allow the chat chatbots to include the sources that it observed from MVI in its answer. OK, so there's one other part to this, which is the user interface. And I used Streamlit to do this. Streamlit is a great UI framework in Python. 
if you have any kind of machine learning application, it allows you to get a really dazzling demo up in short order. And so the whole user interface is right here. This is in the repo in case you want to study it and reproduce it on your own. OK, so let's get back to RoboMo. So RoboMo is running on the web. There's a URL in case you want to go ask it some questions. And so here it is in the browser. This is the Streamlit UI that I just uh, showed you. And it's going to answer your questions. And so Memento offers all sorts of services from caching, topics, vector index to leaderboards. And so let's ask some questions about that. I think the demo gods may be uh, cursing me here. We'll see. I reloaded my browser just before this. There you go. Go run this one. There we go. Don't say anything bad about Romo, though. I could hear you. That's great. And you can also say, something else. So you can see RoboMo can answer your questions. Uh, it's staying, it knows all about Memento, its services and products, because we've indexed that data in Memento Vector Index, and we're directing the chatbot to use that search index as potential sources for users' questions. Uh, you can see in this other question, it cited its sources for the answer, which is pretty cool. You can go click on these. So that is RoboMo, I encourage you to go ask RoboMo questions of your own. OK. So to wrap up the talk, I'm going to go into a little bit of troubleshooting, a few more practical nuggets for you. So we talked about the role of search in a chatbot when we're using retrieval augmented generation. That's the name for using search as a way to boost up your chatbot. What are some common pitfalls here when you use this technique? Well, suppose you don't you ask the chatbot a question and you don't get the answer you want. So what you should do is start collecting some representative questions and the answers that you expect, run them through the chatbot, and inspect the results of your system. And once you do this, you can start noticing some trends in the answers. And this can allow you to raise new questions like, are the answers to my question even documents in the index? So if I'm directing the chatbot to answer my question by looking in, by doing a search, well, if the answer to the question isn't even in your search index, then there's nothing it can do. That's one of the most uh, easiest things to address. But then there's more subtler things like, what if the answer to the question is too far down on the search results list? Or maybe it's something else. So there's a, a lot of uh, directions you could go here to clear this up. and. Uh, here are some potential pitfalls and things you can do as troubleshooting uh, mechanisms. So if the answer is not in the search index, well, then you can go uh, write up a document and index it right away. That should solve that problem. Now, remember I mentioned the text splitting. And so one problem you could run into is if the answer is actually split up between multiple documents. And so your question, the answer to your question is shattered amongst these documents, and you don't get a good hit. So you could try increasing the text split size. That is, I use 128 tokens. You could try 256. That way, you have better overlap. If the answer is in the top results, but it's, <clears throat> so what if the answer to the question is in the search index? The chatbot can only take into account a few number of search hits from your, uh, from your search that you do. And so if the answer is too far down the search list, then what can you do? Well, I mentioned uh, these vector indexes typically use an approximate search. And so you could try running an exact vector search. And you can see if the answer is further towards the top there. And if it is, you would need to tune the vector index parameters. Now, if you're using Memento Vector Index, we tune this automatically for you so you'll get good performance out of the gate. Otherwise, there's a few other things that can go on. You can check them out on your own. If the answer is in a large block of text, we could decrease the text split size. 
if the answer is in the top results, but the answer that we get back is not what we want, we could prompt do prompt engineering on the question answering prompt. And then there's a whole grab bag of things that require more effort if this isn't working. Uh, we could do query augmentation if our queries have just very poor concept and word overlap with answers. We could try other text embedding models. We could do introduce re-ranking models. This puts more sophistication in our search pipeline. Um, and all, you could go all the way down towards training your own text embedding model. That's a lot of work though. So just to wrap up um, the talk, we asked some key questions and we saw the answers. Uh, the chatbot knows about Memento docs and examples because we augmented the chatbot with this search engine. The search works by using text embedding models. And I showed you a really intuitive everyday analogy to grocery stores on how to understand, to think about embeddings. And we saw how the chatbot answers questions. So I think the key insight to this talk was the vector space model. We could take any object, whether it's a text, image, audio, if we can represent it as a vector, then the similarity between two pieces of text, even text and image, boils down to vector similarity. So as long as we have, can come up with a good way of making a vector representation that captures meaning in the ways we care about, then we can apply these uh, common set of methods. And then lastly, you need to, if, if you buy into this, then if you want to get this to scale, then you need an efficient search and uh, data management system. That's something that uh, Memento Vector Index provides. It makes it effortless. All you need is an API key, which you can get from our console. And that's it for the key takeaways. So that concludes the talk. And so, we do have a few minutes remaining for questions, uh, if you have any. But otherwise, uh, thank you for your attention.